Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Profile Podcast. I'm Sam Hales, editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the UK's leading Christian publication, features interviews, news, reviews, columnists and so much more. This show, The Profile, is normally broadcast on Premier Christian Radio. However, this week, Premier Christian Radio has been pausing its regular output, including The Profile. And the reason is, Premier Christian Radio have launched an urgent transmission appeal, asking for financial support. It's only because of generous people who give of their finances that Premier Christian Radio stays on the air. If you would like to help Premier Christian Radio close the funding gap, you can go to premierchristianradio.com and give online. I also wanted to take a moment to thank subscribers to Premier Christianity magazine. It's because of people like you that we are able to make not only the monthly print publication, but also put this podcast together each and every week for you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Premier Christianity magazine, you can do so online at premierchristianity.com. At the moment, we've got a fantastic offer for you where if you subscribe now, we will send you free of charge Hillsong the movie. This is a stunning documentary directed by Michael John Warren, who is a six-time Emmy-nominated American film director. He made his directional debut with what many consider to be the greatest hip-hop film of all time, Jay-Z's Fade to Black. And of course, for Hillsong the movie, turned his skills to a very different project. And Hillsong Let Hope Rise, the DVD, will be yours free of charge when you subscribe to the print issue of Premier Christianity magazine. You'll get 12 issues of the magazine delivered direct to your door each and every month. You'll be able to read great interviews just like the one you're about to hear. And of course, you'll be updated with news and analysis on church trends, what's happening in the Christian world and what's happening in the culture as well. So that's the two ways you can support us here at Premier. Go to premierchristianradio.com to give to Premier Christian Radio's financial appeal or go to premierchristianity.com and subscribe to the magazine. Do either or both of those things and that will really help us in our mission here at Premier. But without any further ado, let's get into today's show. My colleague Justin Briley has interviewed David Suchet, and that's the interview you're about to hear. This was first broadcast on Premier Christian Radio back in 2014, but it's never aired on the Profile podcast. So today gives us a great opportunity to bring it to you for the first time. Some great stories here from the actor David Suchet. Without any further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Justin Briley. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Well, my guest today is known to millions of people for playing a curly moustached and slightly plump Belgian detective on TV and film. I'm speaking, of course, of Poirot, Agatha Christie's most famous crime-solving sleuth. But the man behind the moustache is David Suchet, a classically trained actor with a strong personal Christian faith. On today's programme, I'll be talking to David about playing the famous detective and his other roles, growing up in a nominally Christian family, but discovering Christ in a dramatic fashion once his film and TV career was well underway. It involves a bathtub and a hotel room. Most recently, David Suchet has been digging into the Bible. He presented two BBC programmes tracing the life of St Paul last Christmas, and he's recently finished recording the entire Bible in an audio project. We'll be hearing segments from both of those projects later on in the programme. David Suchet, welcome to the programme. Uh, let me first start by asking, do you ever feel like you'll, you'll escape the shadow of the, the Belgian detective? It's a good question. I I think the best answer I can give you is that if you were to write my obit (laughs) now, uh, the first thing you'd mention is Poirot. Mm -hmm. But because of Poirot and for uh, 20 years before Poirot, I was already known uh, and the the programme that really transformed my Mm. career was Blot on the Landscape. Mm -hmm. That was in 1983, 84. And I'd already headed three series before then, plus 16 years with the Royal Shakespeare Company, plus three West End shows. So when I came to Poirot, I was, um, if you like, known Mm. as a a British classical character actor. And it was through my character work did I get Poirot, which shot me further 
into the public consciousness. But mm. more than that, it shot me around the world Absolutely. into mm. 70 territories now. Mm. And so uh, I will be remembered for Poirot. Will I ever escape being locked in? <laughs> I have never been locked in. <laughs> in other words, I, uh, in answer to your question, um, my last West End role was Long Day's Journey Into Night, mm. playing James Tyrone which is as far away as you can get from Poirot, and yet, and that's in the theatre. So fortunately, because of my reputation um, as, a, as, a, as a classical actor, I've never actually mm. been locked in, and I've always considered that one of the greatest privileges that I've been given yes. as an actor, yes. that I've never been locked in or typecast. There was a danger of me being typecast mm. at one point in my career as a terrorist in, in American movies yes. because of a film I did called Executive Decision mm. with Kurt Russell. Mm. Mm. And I decided to, because I'd played about two or three in a row, I had to start turning those roles down because in, in Hollywood you get typecast very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, mercifully... In England, I was playing a role that was character. And as you say mm. at the beginning of this question, which I've taken a long time to answer, <laughs> do forgive me, but you've said, I am very different. I have a deep voice. I look very different. And I'm not really like him. I am like him in certain ways in my private life, but not... I mean, you will recognize the face, of course. Of course. Yes. But then when I start speaking, you'll go, oh, it doesn't sound like yes. Poirot. And, 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 I'm and sure... when I walk, you'll say, oh, he doesn't walk like Poirot. So, in fact, I am different. And yes. I literally am more grateful for anything <laughs> that Poirot is a character, mm, mm. Uh, a foreigner, mm. and I can take him off yes. and then but, I can but, play other things. Uh, more so the, even than the original Ag Agatha Christie novels, you have in the public consciousness given the the definitive, you know, figure of Poirot. Now. I can't. I really can't say that myself. Really? Definitive is is uh, a word that is given by people to others. Uh, <laughs> if you say you think I'm the definitive, <laughs> then I will say thank you very much. But it's not for me to say. I mean, I think you've filmed just about every story. I've got four more okay. to go. Four more to go. Okay, right. So you, once those four are done, yeah. will Poirot be done? He will certainly be I'm, That's a good question. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been asked to whether I would consider doing stories that are not written by Agatha Christie because the one thing I really must say that every single story I've done, and it's nearly 70 now, mm. are all Agatha Christie. Yes. There's not one that isn't. Mm. It's amazing. Her mm. turnover mm. was extraordinary. Mm. Um, I have been asked whether I, w if they took other Agatha Christie yes. stories, which they've done with Miss Marvel, mm, mm. and put Poirot, Poirot on top, in. would I do mm, them? Mm. No. Oh. But what I would do, uh, if they want to do a remake for a movie, mm. okay, the answer yes. would be yes, yes, because A, it's a different medium, yep. and B, it would be a different type yeah. of script. Yeah, absolutely. It would be, um, at the most, it would be a 90-minute script yeah. instead of a two-hour yeah. script, and it would be a different format, and I'd reach a different audience. So, yes, I'd make a remake of a television I've done, but I don't want to do and not looking to do any yeah. more Poirot Absolutely. for television. On a personal level, do you feel like any of his uh, detective qualities have seeped into your, your own um, character in as much as when you watch a crime drama, are you better at predicting who done it? No, or anything no, like that? no, I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm not good at predicting who done it. But what he's done for me is he's made me more observant. Mm -hmm. And he's really taught me to listen mm. and to observe the person with whom I'm talking. Absolutely. In other words, what he does and what I've learned to do, because I've played him for so long, it's, mm. it's impossible not to, is um, I will listen to what you say, but I will hear what you mean. Well, I, that, that makes me feel very self-conscious. <laughs> well, he does. Yes, yes. He does. <laughs> and people, people find him very unnerving mm. um, because he will look at you, and I do. I've always done that, though, but mm. he will look at you right yeah. in the eye. Mm. But he's observing every single thing, not yes, only the, yeah. the hand under your chin, but most importantly, the left hand under your elbow. Uh, yes, the, 
It is, and this, and, yeah. and he, I, I will be summing, un, unfortunately, when I'm with people now. <laughs> um, that's what he's done for Yeah, me. you're doing and a little analysis every time. Well, no, yeah. no, it's not an analysis. It's not an analysis. It's being absolutely... Because if it's analysis, mm. that means energy is going into me. Right. That means I am thinking mm. all the time. I won't. That'll happen later for him. Okay. Where he sits and puts his hand in yeah. the cathedral <laughs> like this, and he will th he will sit and work out. He will give you absolutely total attention without missing one detail. There you go. And that's... He's helped me uh, enormously, not only as a person to be able to listen well, which is one of the greatest compliments you can mm. ever give to anybody, mm. is to yeah. what I call give good ear, mm. a la mm. Shakespeare, lend me your ears, yes. says um, uh, Br uh, Brutus, isn't it? The friends, Romans and countrymen, lend me your ears. It's an active yes. uh, thing Absolutely. to listen well without formulating answers mm. while you're listening. And... Um, and the observance, observe, observing everything around you. Mm, uh, mm. So, yeah, he's taught me that. I just wanted to go back a little bit. Well, a lot, actually. Um, life growing up. Um, you, you're, you, you have a Christian faith now, but did you grow up with any kind of religious observance at home when you were? N no. My father was, uh, when he grew up in South Africa, up until well, and then he moved to England in his late twenties. He was brought up very much uh, as a Jew, mm -hmm. and my mother was brought very much up as a Christian uh, because her parents were. Well, her mother was a Christian, mm -hmm. and she came. She came from a Christian family uh, in from Sandwich. My grandmother on my mother's side, yes, but all my paternal side mother and father, are Lithuanian Jews. Right. Um, all of them. Mm. So, well, Lithuania, Russia, mm -hmm. whatever you'd mm -hmm. like to mm -hmm. say. So on the male line, yep. I'm Russian. Mm -hmm. On the female line, I'm Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so you really are talking to somebody who's split almost yes. down the middle, well, not quite down the middle, but three quarters to a quarter, mm. of uh, Eastern European mm -hmm. and Kent. Mm. Right. <laughs> Which is a great mixture. Um, it's a wonderful yeah, mixture. Yeah, yeah. It, yes, because I was born in London. Yeah. I grew up in England. I had a wonderful education. My father worked day and night to provide that for mm, me just mm, after the war. Mm. So I, I was uh, sent away to boarding school very early, but it did afford me a, 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 a good education, although mm. I hated being sent away. But, and where I was sent... Mm. Uh, was a Church of England school. Right. And in okay. fact, on my form, mm. uh, when it said religion, uh, he put a C of E. Right. Which, of course, there's no religion at all. <laughs> I don't know of a religion called Church of England. No, but I suppose... I know a religion called would... Christianity, but I don't know of a religion <laughs> naming a church. When, at what point, though, did faith become real for you? I mean, would you mind sort of giving us a bit of the, the detail of that? Uh, well, but I, I can only do it very briefly because yes, you, sure. you, otherwise you have to write a book rather than an article <laughs> uh, because it does. It, it's a very, very long story. Sure, but sure. basically, I think like most people born at my time, which the boom babies of nineteen mm. four, late 40s or 46, I was born, um, into the era of uh, moving from a rather conservative uh way of life in England moving to the 50s and then the over-liberal uh, society of the mm. 60s going into the 70s and the aggression of the 80s mm. into mm. the 90s and now it's turning again. Yes. But if you look at that period uh, we were very much influenced in the 60s, late 50s and 60s by the Beatles, by the mm. Rolling Stones, by everybody looking for spiritual enlightenment mm. and they used to go off to India, didn't yes, they? They used absolutely. to go off to their gurus yeah, yeah, yeah. and suddenly uh, the Church of England, uh, Christianity mm -hmm. in the Church of England was slightly sidelined as people romantically looked towards the East for their religion, forgetting, mm. of course, that Christianity mm. was mm. an Eastern faith. Mm. Um, so why do I mention that? I mention that because growing up, I was always searching for something. Mm. But knowing and feeling very much of an outsider at school because I was so aware of my Jewish background mm. Mm. and never really fully aware of my Christian background. 
neither were put on us. Mm. So at that time, I was neither christened nor confirmed or baptized. Right. And so I went on and on and on and on. Cut to jump cut to 1986 mm -hmm. um, when I'm making a film in America. Mm -hmm. This is a very short version now. Yes. Uh, lying in the bath, thinking about the man who transformed, well, not transformed, but has been the biggest influence of my life, uh, which was my late grandfather, mm. James Jarche, uh, photographer. And he was for me, and st still is, very much alive and was at that time almost my, my guide. I used mm. to talk to mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. And I was lying in the bath in the hotel room in... Uh, in Seattle mm. and I suddenly th started thinking about the afterlife because I said to myself I don't believe in the afterlife <laughs> why there's no, nothing to prove that there is an afterlife and and then I thought well why am I why am I thinking about and talking to my grandfather who's dead mm. if I don't believe he's alive quite so that's what you do in the bath, isn't yes, it? You yeah, think. Absolutely. I yeah, mean, it's a yeah. great, great moments of <laughs> eureka have happened in baths. So um, I got out of the bath and thought about this. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I believe in the afterlife? And I don't believe in the afterlife because I certainly don't believe in Jesus. Mm. Um, but I suppose that's the only place I'm going to find out about the afterlife. But I don't believe in Jesus. I never mm. had done. Mm. Um, but, oh, I remember someone called Paul. Okay. Who was real, mm. who did live. And I knew that he was responsible for changing the thinking of the Western world. Mm. And I thought, yeah, well, now I've, I, oh, I remember. Yeah, he wrote some letters in the Bible. I remember mm. doing that at Divinity at school. Right. So I thought... Oh, I'll, I'll f see if I can find Paul. So cutting a very long story short of yes, how I, I got the Bible and yeah, all the rest of yeah. it, because that's a pages of, of your <laughs> notebooks. Very good story. But it's, not, <laughs> it's not for now. Um, I started reading the letter to the Romans because mm. I'm fascinated by Rome, always been fascinated by Rome and the Roman Empire and, and everything like that. And I started reading his letter to the Romans, but not as the letter heading. Uh, I'd already been in the RSC, and I know, for me, the best way to read a, a classical play that's been around for centuries, mm. to read it afresh, is to imagine that I'm reading the first a draft. Yes. So I thought, well, the Bible's been, this letter's been around for about <laughs> 2,000 years, but I'm not going to read it as scripture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it as a letter. Good. Okay. So yes. for the first time, but it's addressed to me, mm -hmm. not to the Romans. Mm -hmm. It's addressed to David. And that's how I read it. And when I came to chapter eight, the fir first eight chapters, I, I didn't know what I was reading about at all because I had, didn't understand what he was talking about. Um, or the theology of it and the background of it and all that. Um, but from eight onwards, I suddenly found a way of being and a way of existing and a way of thinking and behaving and caring and looking at the world in a completely different way. And by the end of it, by the end of that letter, I was very moved, very emotional. I believed I had found what I had been, if you like, under the surface mm. looking for mm. in the 60s mm. and the yeah. 70s. Yeah. And now in the mid-80s, I this is what I wanted a bit. This I had found. Right. Forget the gurus, yeah. forget everything. I'd found a way of being, that, as he describes the Christian life yes. in the yes. later chapters yeah, of Romans. Absolutely, yeah. Mind you, I'm in good company. Augustine was also converted <laughs> by Rome and many others. Um, possibly the most influential letter for conversion Absolutely, ever written. Absolutely, yeah. However, I had a problem, a big problem presented to me. Because if you remember, I have just said I didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Indeed. So how did Paul find out what he was writing about? Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm. So that took me to the Gospels. Okay. Because so. I now had to find out who was responsible for making Paul write this way. And, so and that was the beginning. Paul introduced you to the person Paul of Jesus. Paul introduced me to the person of Jesus who I disbelieved.
Well, it seems appropriate at this point to hear a segment from a recent project you've been involved in, David, recording the entirety of the Bible.、Uh, the Book of Acts and Paul's letters can be heard on the website in the footsteps of St Paul. co. uk, which also has links to download the audio. So here's David narrating the conversion of St Paul himself, as told in the Book of Acts, chapter nine. Meanwhile, Saul. Was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the Way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, "Saul, Saul." Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him, to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, "Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, and their kings, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer." For my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, "Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit." Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up, and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, "Isn't he the man who caused havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name?" And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night. And lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them. And moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Well, that was David Suchet reading from Acts chapter nine, the conversion 
of St. Paul. And you can find also the Gospels, uh, the Book of Acts and the letters of the New Testament are all downloadable now. And uh, I understand that the full Bible in its entirety read by David will be available to buy as well by April next year. Uh, The story of Paul, of course, is very relevant to your own. And we're going to talk a bit more about that later on and about this big Bible reading project itself. But we've been talking about your conversion and becoming part of the Church of England. Let me say, from 1986 to 2012, uh, I only got confirmed four years ago. Well, that, I read that and I thought, that's very interesting. You were obviously baptised, presumably. Fairly I was baptised, yes, because when I was in Seattle, I, I went through such... I mean, as as your readers, Christian readers, will know... Mm. A conver- conversion is not necessarily a pleasant time. Uh, it can be very, very difficult uh, indeed. And I managed to find someone who happened to be in a particular type of church who explained to me what was going on. Right. He was a pastor in an American okay. church. And by the time I came back to England, I was in fact baptised. Right, okay. But as you say, it took quite a while around to, to getting confirmed in the Anglican church, which yes. is where you found your home eventually as it were well yes. for a long time you, yes. you found your home there um what what actually made you think get round to doing it then a few years ago i was having lunch with the chaplain of the chapel royal um the previous chaplain not the present chaplain i was having a sunday lunch with him and um he i told him this story uh, but it went on much longer and then mm. i met on another occasion yeah. with him and he said um when were you confirmed and i said i've never been confirmed so he said, what, oh, really? I said, no, I've never been confirmed. He said, but you take communion. <laughs> this had never occurred to you as so, no, being an issue? No, 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 no never. And it uh, still doesn't. No. Um, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so he, we had, an argu- we had a, a yeah. sort of argument yes. about, uh, <laughs> he said, well, you should be. And I said, why? And, you know, th- we had a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful argument. So he said, well, look, irrespective of anything else, he said... Uh, don't you think it's time you were? So he explained to me what confirmation was, which is confirming mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in my heart, in my head, uh, my faith, which I had to then think about again. Mm. Because since 1986, I had struggled with Christianity, mm. as I still do mm. struggle with Christianity. Mm. But at least at that time and since then, and it's, my confirmation has given me an anchor to get mm, back to this, mm, the best thing about confirmation mm, for me. Mm, two things, A, the confirming, yeah. but B, it gives you an anchor to go back to yeah. when, you, when you go through your doubts and yeah. desert you know, experiences, you feel, you know, what's it all about? You can go back to your confirmation. And that's a very important anchor point. Um, and I thought about it long and hard. And I thought, am I ready and it was not uh, an easy decision, but I thought, you know, yes, I'm willing not only to confirm, but to 100% commit. Mm. And that's what confirming yeah. meant to yeah. me, yeah. being firm with, con with, firm. You're listening to The Profile in association with Christianity magazine. I'm Justin Briley in conversation today with actor David Suchet. You may know him best for playing TV detective Poirot and we'll continue to talk to David in the next part of the programme about working as a Christian in TV, film and theatre as well as finding out more about his passion for the life of St Paul and indeed the Bible. Join me again in a few minutes' time. Premier Christianity magazine in this month's issue... We give you a rare glimpse inside China's underground church as Paul Hathaway gives us the lowdown on what's been called the greatest revival in history. His special report reveals how the nation's 100 million Christians are thriving and seeing many miracles and salvations despite serious persecution. Plus, find out why Benny Hinn has renounced the prosperity gospel, get equipped to help those suffering with mental ill health, and be inspired by the Christians who are proving you're never too old to go on mission. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. 
Welcome back to the program. This Saturday afternoon, it's the profile in association with Christianity magazine. Every Saturday, you can hear Christians from the politics, media, art, sports, science, and many more areas of life speak about their faith. I'm Justin Briley, and my guest today is David Suchet, a classically trained actor who's played many roles in his life, but probably best known as the definitive face of Agatha Christie's Poirot. David, we've already heard about your conversion and how St Paul figured in that. It's it's so interesting that you have quite a lot in common, actually, with, with that man. But um, just as you've obviously been a Christian in the industry you're in, stage and screen, has that presented any pressures? Has um, Have you been able to be quite open with fellow performers and actors about your your faith? I'm not a natural evangelist. It's where Paul and I differ. <laughs> I never will be. And I, it's something that I never talk about unless mm. someone comes to me. Um, and if they do come to me and they want to talk about my faith, I am only too pleased mm. to talk about it in a very positive way, yes. to share the difficulties mm. that I've been through mm. as much as the, the positive yeah. uh, mm. areas. Mm. Um, and actually if you share your difficulties that's a wonderful way in because mm. everybody has problems Absolutely, yeah. rather than saying oh this is what you've got to do yes, uh, be born yes. again and you're too, you know, too much of a I kind of um, i can't go down yeah, that route you, you, because you, you, it wasn't my experience no no absolutely and never yeah. has been yeah. um so do i find it difficult no not since not very early on I found it very easy to say, no, I can't do that. And people say, why? And you say, mm -hmm. I can't do that because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. In exactly the same way as uh, other faiths do. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy. You just make the statement. Yeah. And then and then it's when you try and fudge it mm -hmm. and say, well, I don't know. I don't really think I can do this. Mm -hmm. Or, or um, I think I should do this because, well, yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. just very easy just yeah. to say, I can't do it because I'm a Christian. But it is not the easiest of areas in which to have um, a Christian faith. It's a very easy area in the entertainment industry to be Buddhist mm -hmm. because it's romantic and yeah. it's Eastern mm -hmm. and it has a sort of mysterious quality to it. Mm. Uh, but it's not easy to be a Christian in the in the entertainment industry, although a lot of uh, people in my industry are, in fact, Christian. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's talk about Paul. Now, over the Christmas period last year, a major two-part documentary aired, which you presented. It was called In the Footsteps of St Paul. And we're going to hear uh, the beginning of Programme One now. Uh, if you're listening and you want to find out more about this, see more clips, uh, a bit more background, do go to the website inthefootstepsofstpaul.co. Dot UK. Let's hear the beginning of Programme One. I'm David Suchet, and I'm on a journey around the Mediterranean, following in the footsteps of a man who 2,000 years ago travelled more than 10,000 miles around the Roman world on foot, and many, many more by sea. This is extraordinary. We, we must appear that size from up there. For the last 25 years, I've been fascinated by St Paul. He was a hugely controversial figure in his own time. He still is today. To some, he's the man who did more than anyone else to transform Christianity from a small Jewish sect into the most powerful religion on earth. To others, he's a preacher of prejudices that have echoed down throughout history. And they must have thought the arrogance Absolutely. of the man. Here he is on the basis of, of one vision, so he says. He's telling everybody what Changing they Changing all do. the rules. A man of contrasts and confusions. But if there ever was an historical character I've longed to play, it is Paul. So for me, this is a very personal quest. I could look like that. What do you think? A little bit. A little bit. I'll be seeking out clues in the places he visited, deciphering new evidence from the latest archaeological research, and meeting expert witnesses from around the region to help me uncover this remarkable man hidden within the pages of the New Testament.
Every year, millions of visitors from all over the world make pilgrimages here to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, to what they believe is the site of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. But the reason they remember this crucified carpenter is down to just one extraordinary man. We know him as Saint Paul. More than any other individual, Paul was responsible for transforming a fledgling Jesus movement from a minor sect of Judaism into a new religion that would one day become known as Christianity. Without him, the new faith could have died out 2,000 years ago. Paul was Christianity's first international ambassador, taking the story of Jesus out to the pagan world, sowing the seeds of a new idea that would sweep through the Roman Empire and change the course of Western civilization. Paul's story is told in the New Testament book of Acts and preserved in a remarkable series of his own letters written to small communities of believers scattered around the Roman world. It was one of these letters that I read when I was filming in America about 25 years ago now. I read it in a hotel room. It was addressed simply to the Romans. Even after 2,000 years, the extraordinary passion of Paul's words leap from the page. The hour has come for you to wake from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Well, there you go. That was the introduction to In the Footsteps of St Paul, a major two-part documentary that aired on the BBC last Christmas and was presented by my guest today on The Profile, David Suchet. Well, you've played a famous detective. I guess it was a bit of a detective story, unearthing the man behind the, the yeah, letters. Yeah, very, very much so. Because, um, I mean, obviously, I knew about Paul and I've, I've read more books about Paul than I have about anybody else in my life because of what he did to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I learned all about him. And one of my um, desires as an actor, and in fact, I commissioned two scripts to be written about Paul, mm. uh, neither of which I, 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 I thought were good enough. And um, it's very, very hard to get biblical, in inverted comma, films off the ground, mm. unless they have a modern slant yeah, to it and sure. things like that. Mm. But uh, I've always wanted to play him mm. because, you know, not trust because I'm a Christian. I think that's the last reason I wanted to play him. I think the main reason I wanted to play him was the same reason I wanted to play Sigmund Freud, uh, which, who I did play, yes. um, because he is another man that has changed worldview, mm. has changed the thinking of the modern Western world. And what a wonderful character to play. <laughs> I'm a little old for him now, <laughs> and I've never got anything off the ground. No plays have ever been written about him. It's so, amazing what they can do with CGI these, these days, though, isn't it, David? Yes. So you never uh, know. In my case, it's CGI <laughs> and not plastic surgery. Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> <laughs> but when... I mean, so, so it's always been... One of the great books about yes. Paul is mm. H.V. Morton's... Mm. Um, in, in the steps of St. Paul. And it's always been a desire to go on his journeys, always, either in a film playing mm -hmm. him or whatever. And there was a, a, a company, and I met uh, Ray Bruce, uh, because I was narrating mm -hmm. a program that they had made yes. uh, on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we were talking, and we got on immediately. We almost became like brothers, really. And uh, I said, you know what I'd like to do? Now you've done this documentary on Jesus, which is a wonderful documentary, and it, well, and it is a wonderful documentary. I said, I want to do my documentary about St. Paul. And he got very excited about mm, this. Mm. And, but he said, we shall do it. Great. And God bless him. And there you go. He did. He, he provided me with the opportunity to literally walk in the footsteps. Yeah. of St. Paul. Yeah. It's been, it was a transforming yeah. experience because I learned more on that journey. You know they say that going to the Holy Land is the fifth gospel. Yes. Well, going in the footsteps of St. Paul was for me the sixth yes. Yes. gospel yeah. because I'd done the Holy Land and now this was the sixth. And 
it's it, it would just prove the most extraordinary experience, mm. one of the mm. most extraordinary mm. experiences mm. of my life, mm. both on a personal level and as an actor. Did, as, you, and did you feel you could transport yourself back two thousand years yeah. to, to when he was yes. walking? Because absolutely. I mean, even though obviously it's all much more modernised these days, the cities that he no, I can do that because I have a, been blessed with a huge imagination, <laughs> and as an actor, yes, yeah. I can do that. I could yeah. stand where he stood, yeah. walked where he walked, yeah. um, saw through mm. what might have been there mm. uh, because of everything that I'd read. Yeah. I mean, I've read over thirty books on him, and and, and has has he changed uh, from that day you've picked up that letter yeah. in 1986 yeah. and read through it yeah. to today, knowing yeah. him so well now. Yes. Uh, has your view of him changed over that time? Completely. In what way? I approached St Paul, even though I'd read uh, lots of books, I approached St Paul with great trepidation because I knew I would have to face what I believed was a, not only a very difficult man, mm. but, uh, I mean, character-wise, extremely difficult man, um, but I would have to face the one thing I couldn't deal with mm. about him was his, uh, to me, apparent misogyny. Right. Mm. And this was always a stumbling block for me. This is where, I mean, in the letters it would be, I do not permit a woman to teach. Yeah, uh, those sorts of those sorts of. It must be silent yes, in church yes, and all the rest yes. of it. And um, speaking to lots of biblical scholars uh, mm. on my journey, mm. and Pauline scholars, and many women biblical scholars, uh, that was completely blown away. Right, completely blown mm. away. Mm. And I learned about a man whose whose mission was affected by one thing and one thing only not the content of his mission mm -hmm. but his rush mm. Uh, mm. and how he didn't have any time for segregation or right. or, 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 yeah. or or anything that way for or selectivity yeah he really believed the end of the world was about to occur mm. he was not planning for the future no to him the future would be the new kingdom mm. he was living in his own terms mm. in the end times of what he knew yes, yes. and that christ's return was imminent mm. Mm. even though he formed groups and churches he did it for the now yes. he did not do it for the 21st century Mm. There would be no 21st century. Mm, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was the one thing. And as soon as you get that embedded mm. in you, all the rest of the pieces of the jigsaw of what he did, what he said, fall into place, mm. including the bit that you mention uh, of women must be silent, yes. mustn't teach, yeah. mustn't uh, mustn't talk in church, and all the rest, and all the head. This this is now very commonly perceived as a church addition, right? Yeah, that wanted more manipulation. It could it could well it be. goes yeah, against yeah. every single mm. tenor mm. of mm. every single other letter yeah. he wrote. Yeah. It's it's very interesting, isn't it? And and obviously. Many of his first converts were women. Uh, his first convert was a woman exactly, called Lydia, Lydia yeah. in Philippi. Absolutely. Um, he wouldn't have done that. He loved women. In mm, fact, mm. there was one church community or, or religious community, that he, a Christian community that he formed. I think it was twen of 29 people. Mm. And of those uh, 26 people, nine were women. Yes, that's not yeah. far yeah. off half. Yeah, absolutely. they weren't priests. I'm not going to get into no, priesthood no, sure, now, sure. <laughs> but they were workers, yes. and he thanks them, yeah. and he yeah. names yeah. them, yeah. and he's grateful to them. In fact, without them, he wouldn't have been able to set up house mm. churches where mm. it was a matriarchal yeah. society, and they let people into their houses. He wouldn't have been able to go in if it wasn't mm. for women. Well, he uh, needed yeah. women. Mm. He was not against women. Yeah. That is a that is. Um, you know, there was somebody staying with me just now, and he mm. said, well, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going off this morning to do uh, something about Paul. He went, ooh, Paul, yeah, Paul. Yes, yes. I said, why? He said, oh, misogynist, misogynist, yeah. hateful man, hateful man. Sadly, 
that is because of those few verses that have now been proved biblically or scholarship wise uh, to be additions later additions and i have gone through now every single other letter of his uh, of his dictated letters mm. they weren't ri- he didn't write them sure, he spoke sure. them mm. And it is quite clear that when you read the New Testament out loud, and most of it are his letters, mm. uh, you will see and uh, and hear a man speak mm. about women mm. with mm. huge respect, mm. huge love, mm. and desperate need. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let's kill that right now. <laughs> but when I say let's kill it, that's what I had to do, and yeah, that was my yeah. that was my blinding moment, if you like, on the footsteps of St. Paul. That once that was gone, I could embrace him in a totally new, different way. You you seem to have also developed something of a love affair recently with the Bible. Um, you've become one of the vice presidents of the the Bible Society, yes. as I understand it. Significantly, you've recently completed recording the entire Bible in an audio project. Why 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 now? What what what's changed recently to to bring the Bible so into focus? In, in I, I, life? Uh, as as an actor, I believe, and as a Christian actor, I believe. Um, it's something that I, as a, as a one voice, have, have wanted to do. Mm. Uh, not just because they're some of the greatest stories uh, ever told, but the Bible, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, like Paul in, in his way, the Bible has been the most influential book ever put together, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and spans a history of over 4,000 years. And... Uh, when I started to read the Bible to myself, um, I, it blew my mind away. Mm. And my faith is rooted in Scripture. Mm. And it gets knocked in our intellectual, rationalist uh, society when people debunk it. And mm. we can come up with, mm. especially when you're studying the historical yes, Christ, sure, you can sure. come up with things like, well, that nothing can be proved and scripture mm. can't be proved. But my faith is rooted in scripture mm. and it mm. will always be rooted in scripture. And it is something that 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 I felt I wanted to do, desperately mm. wanted mm. to do before I die. And it's as simple as that. <laughs> and the opportunity was once again given to me by Ray, um, and to do this, knowing that it was my one main am- reading ambition. Well, let's hear some of the Bible project read in your own voice. Uh, I'm told the full Bible read by yourself will be available to buy by next April. And the Gospels, as well as Acts and the letters from the New Testament, are already available for download. So this is David Suchet reading from the Gospel of John, Chapter 3, Jesus meeting with Nicodemus. John, Chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes 
may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. That was David Suchet reading from John chapter 3, part of the uh, full audio of the entire Bible. It's been a huge project, uh, available in its entirety by April next year. But for now, you can download the book of Acts, the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament. Uh, find out more at in the footsteps of St. Paul co dot uk. You're known for your meticulous characterization and research into the characters you play but when it comes to the bible doing the whole bible well it must be pretty difficult to research every character you're going to essentially be voicing in the it, course of that. It, well the main the the, the 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 main thing is 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 not that um although it's tempting to think that that would be the case because the characters that i'll be reading about uh, in the stories are vi- uh, great but they're not to be characterized no. The most important thing is the character who wrote them. Mm. Once you know who wrote them, the purpose for writing them, yes. when they were written, you have an idea then of why. Yes. Once you have an idea of why, you can then read them with a certain, um, if you like, direction to know where you're going with them. Yep. So each book or each tranche of any book uh, written by one person or maybe two people or maybe three people and you can if you study the language of the the piece you can see and you can feel uh, where where the writer is going um, that's the most important person mm. to think mm. about when you're reading yeah, out loud absolutely. it's uh, like psalms uh, you can't just I, I can't just read one to fifty one or a hundred and whatever sure. it is hundred. yeah 50 psalms um, uh, and do them all the same they are individual yeah. and written by different people different for voices. different purposes yeah. different voices and some angry and some prayerful and some jubilant and some mm. praising mm. and you can't just read them flat they're written for purposes it was yes. Jewish prayer book for yes, goodness yes. sake and so th- who wrote them why read them like that and then and that's the way the Bible comes alive for me and it's the way I hope when people listen to the recording what I don't want them to say is oh isn't that beautifully read yes. I'm not interested in no. that I'm not mm. interested in getting notes or plus marks <laughs> or minus marks or being appraised of how I read it what I want people to hear is maybe the intention behind what I yeah. read be interested to know about David the man when he's not on stage or in front of the cameras what do you do to relax I understand you're a keen photographer and, and that sort of thing yes uh, I love photography. I really enjoy listening to music. Mm-hmm. And I really uh, enjoy reading um, theology. Yes. Not from an intellectual point of view, but I love reading about uh, the history of the early church. I mean, I've, I've spent the last two months studying the Reformation in the English settlement, the Elizabethan settlement. Uh, I'm really interested in that. I'm really interested in the early church, how it all began. Yeah. And that's become a fascination yeah. for me over the last yeah. two or three years, actually. Um, so my relaxation is that and spending time at home, which is yeah. something that I don't have enough of. <laughs> but it's, yes, I'm, I'm, that's, the, that's what I do to relax. Well, it's been really fascinating to get to know you a bit today, David. Thank you so much for being my guest on The Profile today.
Do hope you enjoyed that conversation between Justin Briley and David Suchet. Remember, if you want to check out more great interviews like that, there's a fantastic archive on the Profile podcast. And if you are enjoying what you're hearing, we'd really appreciate it if you could give us a rating and a review. It really helps others discover this show. So please rate us, review us, and share the episode with others who might enjoy it. Before we go, final reminder that there are two ways you can support what we're doing here at Premier. If you've been enjoying these interviews and you want to support Premier Christian Radio financially, you can do that now at premierchristianradio.com. The urgent transmission appeal is currently running there at premierchristianradio.com. The other way you can support us is by subscribing to the print magazine that makes this podcast possible. It's Premier Christianity magazine. News, features, reviews and interviews like this one each and every month deliver direct to your door and you'll get a free gift Hillsong Let Hope Rise Hillsong the movie it's a fantastic DVD an incredibly well shot documentary about the rise of Hillsong you'll get that absolutely free when you subscribe to the print magazine premierchristianity.com we'll be back same time same place next week with another great interview for you until then have a great week